Building a learning roadmap is the most difficult yet the most important thing you do on your learning journey. Thankfully, there are many awesome people like Cameron Ahmad who have contributed their time and resources to creating some of these roadmaps for you. And they're amazing because they help you figure out what you don't know yet. However, roadmaps are roadmaps. They're high level, they miss a lot of nuance, they're not really opinionated. Sometimes they're even biased to the creator's journey, which might be a bit different than yours. So I want to spend a few minutes in this video talking about the backend engineer roadmap, adding my opinions to it, not necessarily as a critique, but you should think of it as an appendix or an, as an addendum to the roadmap that can guide you along your way and can help you prioritize what you need to study and what topics are more important than others and how you can get to a point where you are productive as fast as possible. Let's dig right in. Now that I have a copy of this roadmap on my iPad, I want to first start by saying that the designers of this did a really good job. I mean, this this really covers a lot of the different topics that backend engineers should be familiar with. Um, but before we really dig into it and I start providing my input on it and, and show you how you can build a learning path from this, uh, I want to start by clarifying a few misconceptions because the term roadmap here is a bit misleading, right? It implies a number of things that I don't find to be very helpful. Number one is the end game is pretty vague. Like what are you going to achieve if you learn all of these things, right? Do you become a good backend engineer? Do you need to know all of these topics for you to be a good backend engineer? Where should you stop? Where can you start being productive? When can you get your first job? For example, if you're starting from scratch, right? What are the main fundamental topics you should learn? And this roadmap doesn't really clarify that. And this is what I'm going to be doing in this video. I'm going to be helping you categorize the different topics, structure them and build a learning path out of this roadmap for you to get to a point where you're productive and then i'm going to give you different levels of how you can evolve your learning beyond that point number two studying these topics top to bottom is it really the most effective way right um and i personally don't really agree with that because if you look here as just a quick example web servers are literally at the bottom of this roadmap and in my opinion for you to be a good back engineer for you to be even to start as a backend engineer, you know, the first things you start interacting with are web servers. And these are the first things you should start picking up, learning how they work, setting them up, configuring them, so on and so forth. So it doesn't really make sense for them to be at the bottom. Maybe what the designers had in mind is that in terms of complexity, building web servers might be a little bit more tricky. And this is not necessarily something you would do from the day one. But I don't necessarily agree with that one. And I will explain a little bit. Um, how you should go about it. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, I'm gonna go through this roadmap and I'm gonna annotate it and I'm gonna categorize the topics into four different categories. P1 are pretty much the fundamentals. That's it. There's like, this is the, these are the building blocks. You, there's no escaping them. You need to learn them in one way or another for you to be able to level up and move on to the next stage. P2 is gonna be your, basically your working knowledge, right? You, this is the level, these are the topics you should know for you to be productive, for you to be able to solve problems and maybe even charge money for them. You could even potentially find your first job using what the knowledge you have at P2 level, right? P3 is basically going above and beyond. And that means um, you can pretty much be productive, make money. If you know these topics, you're going to bring in more value to your employers. You don't necessarily have to know these topics from day one, but if you know them, Perfect, that's great. P4 are pretty much optional topics and they are either advanced or they don't necessarily impact you as a backend engineer on a day-to-day -day basis, but also knowing them will bring in more value. And maybe when the context changes, when you work at a bigger company or when you solve problems at scale, then these topics start coming into play much more than what you would have at the beginning. So let's start by defining the P1 topics. Let's see over here. So internet, for example, Everything under the internet, in my opinion, is P1. Uh, you cannot really go about, you cannot really move forward without developing a basic understanding of these things. How does the internet work? What is HTTP, browsers and how they work, DNS, so on and so forth. You need to understand these and you don't really need to dig too deep, just a high level understanding, maybe a couple of YouTube videos explaining them from a high level perspective should be good enough for you right now. The topic that you need to dig a little bit deeper into probably is gonna be HTTP and understanding the whole HTTP request response mechanism and how does it work under the hood will definitely bring in a lot of value, especially as you move up the stack. So 
front end knowledge definitely it's gonna come in quite handy and i think this is p1 level material as well because i mean you know as a back-end engineer you're gonna be building what you're gonna start by building web pages you're not gonna build apis from the get-go you're gonna start playing with the browser a little bit and having a little bit of html and css knowledge will definitely take you a long way with that uh, javascript will definitely be considered also one of the fundamental topics although we're gonna discuss the topic of languages in a bit so you might want to hold off on javascript if you know javascript and you pick it up it's very easy it's great all the good for you uh, if not that's fine you can wait on it a little bit when it comes to os and general knowledge i think terminal usage is definitely gonna be p1 how operating systems work in general also from a high level perspective because operating systems are obviously this gigantic rabbit hole that people specialize in and it takes them years to really understand everything that goes on under the hood but having a high level understanding of how operating systems work and how process management works for example would really be good fundamentals again these are sort of fundamental optional but um it's it's good to know them threads and concurrency i wouldn't say these are necessary from day one uh, basic terminal commands i definitely think these will come in handy so if you learn some of them some of the you know common ones like how you can navigate around your terminal and how you can move around and be productive in your in a terminal context um, this will definitely be handy you don't necessarily need to know all of them from day one you can build up this knowledge as you go and that's totally okay memory management is also one of these topics that is quite tricky to master and it takes might take you years uh, if you haven't really studied computer science this is not something something you will be exposed to from day one so you can postpone this in a way but also having you know watching like one five minute video about basic memory management will definitely bring in a lot of value inter-process communication you can skip io management you can skip posix command posix basics i think this is helpful because sometimes also you need to you know write to the uh, standard output or write standard error especially if you're working on the back end you need to understand how these things work and how pipe pipes work so these will definitely come in handy basic networking concepts that's great and this uh, networking concepts will go hand in hand with your understanding of HTTP and what's going on under the hood. So I would definitely consider this to be fundamental or P1 level knowledge. Now, let's move on to programming languages. Um, here, I really don't care. Like you could pick up any of these languages or even others. Uh, it doesn't really matter. In my opinion, any language you pick at this point is gonna be a good language. Uh, all of these are solid choices and you cannot really go wrong with any of them. Pick the one that's easiest for you to understand and wrap your head around. Uh, I would recommend going for more interpreted languages at the beginning just because they are simpler to set up and they are simpler to work with. You don't really need to worry about compilation and all of that fun stuff you don't really need to worry about static typing and what are the types um, of course they bring in a lot of value and i'm not saying types of typing is not important but from as a beginner you just want to be productive as soon as possible so going for interpreted languages might be helpful and these languages are sort of you know back-end native in a sense um, they have deep deep and nice integrations with web servers and they can allow you to be productive right from the get-go uh, going for something like go for example is very nice but it's gonna overcomplicate things for you and i'm not really sure learning this without any guidance would be the optimal way it's gonna cause you a lot of frustration rust will definitely be the same thing the amount of resources sort of sometimes target the more advanced users as opposed to total beginners um, I might be wrong, there might be some great resources out there, but I am a bit biased towards interpreted languages from the get-go. When it comes to version control systems, I would definitely recommend this. Maybe I will put this in a P2 because you don't really need this as a, as a P1 level knowledge. You will start needing uh, to developing an understanding of version control systems when you want to work um, uh, with others, right? When you want to work with teams, when you want to start publishing your work, when you want to start collaborating. So at this point, I would skip this and I would put it under P2. Relational databases, definitely a critical topic. And I believe it's a P1 level topic. You can pick uh, from any of these. Oracle, don't, don't even bother. MS SQL is good. Although I'm not sure it's good, it's friendly for beginners because it's licensed and it's paid. I would go for something free and open source. 
uh, any of these three would be a good choice. Uh, PostgreSQL is a bit more structured and standardized. Maybe you might want to go for that because it's also a production grade database solution that um, is pretty good to use. So relational databases, definitely no SQL databases. I would not recommend them as P1, P2, P3 maybe. They have their own use cases, but without a good understanding of relational databases, building on top of no SQL databases is not a good idea. Next, some of the fundamentals related to databases are um, understanding what asset is, understanding transactions, the N1, N1 plus one problem, understanding database normalization and indexes and how they work. I think all of these are fundamentals. I skipped ORMs you, because, you know, I mean, you can put it as part of P1, object relational mapping, um, but unless you're really picking up a framework and working with it, ORMs might be more confusing than necessary at the beginning. I mean, at, you can just, uh, what I think of P1 is just writing a simple script that connects, creates a connection to a relational database. Then you can write some basic SQL to query some tables, maybe even generate some tables. And ORMs, it's, a, it's abstraction. It has a lot of magic and I don't think it's really good for someone to be exposed to that from the get-go. That's why we're gonna skip it as part of P1. We're gonna include it as part of P2. Anything regarding replication, sharding, all of that stuff, nope, you can skip it. This is all advanced stuff. Now, learning about APIs, APIs are important. And I think learning about REST is the easiest start. So definitely pick that up as part of your P1 learning. Uh, you cannot really go far professionally without understanding REST APIs at least. Everything regarding JSON APIs and how they work, uh, basically the responses, SOAP, gRPC and whatnot, I think these are advanced topics, so you can wait on those a little bit, but first pick up the fundamentals of REST. And again, this goes hand in hand with your understanding of the HTTP protocol, how it works, and REST is pretty much leveraging that protocol to do more. Also, that goes with uh, APIs, understanding the basics of authentication, extremely important, to understand how secure authentication is done on the web. I would say basic authentication is definitely a good starting point, maybe even token-based authentication, but I would not really dig deeper. Cookie-based obviously is one of the fundamentals. Everything else, OAuth, JWT, OpenID, SAML, these are enterprise-grade authentication mechanisms. I would not really delve into those in it from a P1 context, maybe later. Now, web security fundamentals, at least understanding what hashing functions are and hashing algorithms and how they work md5 what is it why you use it what why not uh, understanding bcrypt and scrypt probably are good fundamentals because if you're gonna deal with creating you know portals that um have a username and a password you need to hash that password probably even salt it and store it in a database securely and in order to do that you're going to need an understanding of these hashing algorithms obviously developing an understanding of what https is uh, is definitely important along with ssl and tls these pretty much go hand in hand i'm not really sure why these are uh, very different. Uh, OWASP, security risk and whatnot. I think these are uh, P2 level topics. We'll get to them in a bit. Testing, unit testing and whatnot. I think these are P2 topics. You know, I mean, it's definitely good for you to learn about unit testing at the beginning, but it's not necessarily fundamental for you to be productive. Uh, some people might disagree, but I mean, the objective of P1 is to get you to a point where you can actually build stuff and see results of your learning, right? We don't wanna guide you through rabbit holes that takes you months and weeks uh, for these topics, for you to pick up these topics. Now, in terms of design and development principles, uh, Gang of Four, design patterns, solid case, maybe case would be good. Uh, and dry, picking up these uh, basics from the beginning, everything else you can just skip for now. Dry is do not repeat yourself. KISS is pretty much keep it simple and stupid. I think you should be, they're very simple to really understand and I think you should know them from the beginning. Search engines, nope, you can skip. Architectural patterns, monolithic apps, microservices, so on and so forth, you can forget those. And what I want you to remember about architectural patterns is that everything in P1 and P2 will revolve around what I'm gonna show you right now. Everything revolves around the three tier architecture, right? Um, everything, everything will be about the client side and then making a request to your web server and then you're gonna have your data persistence or database layer. The flow is always gonna be client initiates request that gets picked up by the web server that goes to the database to 
put in some information or store information and then the response that comes back from the database back to the web server and all the way to the client whatever you do in web keep this in your mind because everything is just a generalization and the scaling of this architecture everything including serverless whatever this is the most fundamental thing to keep in your mind and everything else will revolve around this in a way or another okay so let's come back to our roadmap we can skip message brokers for now containerization virtualization again great to know but not p1 graphql no graph databases you can skip web sockets no web servers now this is definitely p1 knowledge and you need to pick up one of these it depends on the language of choice right so if you picked up for example um, python ruby php then nginx apache would be good candidates for web servers uh, maybe even caddy i'm not really sure uh, if you picked up c sharp for example msiss IIS, sorry, would be a good candidate. So it really depends, uh, but you should definitely learn web servers from the get-go. Migration strategies, all of this stuff. No, you can skip that for now. Cool. And this is everything we have that, in my opinion, you should learn as a fundamental. Now we can jump to pick up uh, to talk about P2 topics. And again, as a reminder, P2 is pretty much when you are productive, you have working knowledge, you can maybe even start charging for your services and maybe work as a junior software or backend developer. And for you to be able to do that, you need to pick up a few extra topics. At this point, understanding threaded threads and concurrency will definitely be important. Maybe even IO management. I wouldn't say inter-process communication at this point uh, would be necessary. Now, this is where Git knowledge definitely comes in hand and it's gonna be very important. You cannot work in any environment without understanding version control systems and understanding how you can collaborate with others. And in order for you to augment this knowledge, having an understanding of Git is not enough. You need to pick up at least one of these repository hosting services or solutions uh, i'm biased towards github because that's where, that's where i work but you can also choose any of the rest they pretty much all cover the same fundamentals it's just that the user experience will differ and some of them some of these solutions offer stuff uh, that other solutions might not next uh, at this point i think orms will definitely come in handy you will see them on your job uh, others will definitely be using them to speed up the development process and the database management process so you should now start learning more about these topics then we jump to other topics about databases i think no sql database is still not p2 knowledge maybe p3 just because it depends on the context really if at work they are using any of these no sql databases then you start you need to learn it uh, but otherwise you can still skip this topic it's not really Im important at this point in time data replication sharding cap theorem they, again not not at this point these are scaling related topics and you don't need them at this point in time JSON APIs definitely comes in handy. SOAP and gRPCs will definitely be handy and important when you are working professionally. Again, it depends on the environment and the type of programming languages they chose for, chose for backend development work. That's why these topics right now are going to be important. OP, open API specs and Swagger will definitely come in handy as well. Um, you need to understand how you can describe your REST APIs, right? Using um, these the standard basically and you might be asked to create some clients based on an open api specification and you need to understand these at this point in time oauth might might or might not be required at the beginning working as a junior developer you probably will be exposed to auth but not necessarily uh, jwt yes open id maybe uh, these are enterprise topics. Um, it depends really on where you work, but I would not consider them P2 knowledge at this point in time. Caching, yep, that's where also you might be exposed uh, to some caching solutions that you are using and you probably need to start understanding a little bit how caching works and what it is. So I would recommend at this point understanding Redis, server-side, client-side caching and CTNs especially if you are working a little bit on the front end type of side. So these will definitely come in handy. I think these are P2 knowledge. At this point in time, also you might be required to start writing your own unit tests and maybe even 
contribute to writing integration and functional testing. This will definitely come in handy. You need to understand CI and CD continuous integration and continuous deployment, because obviously if you're going to be deploying your solutions or whatever code you write, you need to understand what's really happening there. And this is about how your code will play with other people's code when you are working in a collaborative context, right? So this is definitely P2 knowledge that you should acquire as soon as possible. Now, content security policy, basically how browsers behave in an SSL DLS context, what requests they allow from which um, backend server. You need to understand how this works and course comes in to play here. They are, these are, I think, related. And then OWASP security risks. It's very important for you because you're working professionally now. You are responsible for the code you write from a security perspective. You need to understand OWASP security risks. This is also where the gang of four design patterns, you should start dabbling with them. You don't really need to understand them fully at this point in time. There's probably some other senior engineers who are going to really dictate the structure of the code base and whatnot. But understanding the gang of four or, you know, start dabbling with it a little bit. That doesn't mean that you need to implement them in every single code you write. No, but maybe just start reading about them at this point and try to understand the problems that they are trying to solve. Domain-driven design is not necessarily essential. Test-driven development, you can also read about it, but it's also not very essential. Solid principles are, at this point in time, you are working professionally, you need to understand what these are and what they help you with. Solid principles are important. Um, they refer to the single responsibility principle, the open close principle, risk of substitution, interface segregation, dependency inversion. It's very important for you to learn about these things at this point in time and to familiarize yourself with the problem that they are trying to address. Also, YAGNI will come into play and YAGNI is an acronym. It stands for you aren't going to need it. And it refers basically to um, and it refers basically to features should be added only when they are required. So you don't necessarily need to over engineer your solutions. And at this point in time, you will probably start understanding what this refers to and what problems it's trying to address with this principle. Maybe at this point you will engage with search engines like Elasticsearch. Maybe not. It really depends. I'm not sure this is p2 level probably p3 but it depends on the context and where you are currently working in terms of architectural patterns obviously you're going to be exposed to the monolithic apps these are the starting point uh, it depends on also where you work you might be exposed to a microservices environment or a service oriented architecture environment serverless and cqrs it really depends i would not say these are p2 type of level at this point in time because these should be these are looked at as evolutions from all of the other you know architectural principles in the sense that these are more cloud native solutions and and they are not as common as you might think in the wild. But again, it really depends. So whatever, wherever you work, try to understand deeply the architectural pattern of the code base you are currently engaged with in your professional career. And then think of evolving your knowledge and understanding to the other patterns. And obviously there are more patterns than these, but for now, let's just stick to this. Message brokers, you might or might not be exposed. Again, I would not say this is P2 level, probably P3 level. At this point in time, familiarizing yourself at least with virtualization, right? What is virtualization? What are VMs? How do VMs work? How do you spin up and configure a virtual machine yourself? how to use VMs and in which context, how to use them in the cloud, how to use them on-prem, how to use them on your own laptop. This is, these are very important. And then you can start dabbling into containerization after you understand the fundamentals of virtual machines. Yes, there are distinct concepts. There are some similarities in terms of functionality, but fundamentally they are completely different. If you understand virtualization, containerization might be easier to understand than you jumping directly into the concept of containers, which might be a little bit foreign for you at the beginning. Learning about Docker is definitely a good way to go, but obviously there are other solutions in the market that you can also start with, Podman being another example and so many others. GraphQL, I wouldn't say this is P2 type of knowledge yet, uh, but again, it depends on where you are working and whether they are exposing GraphQL APIs. You probably will not be responsible at this point in time in building or implementing a backend GraphQL server which Apollo and uh, Relay Modern are. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to put it as P2. Maybe just read about it if you have time. Graph databases, similar concept. Again, I feel like these are more advanced topics that will not come in handy for you 
to be uh, a professional. WebSockets might or might not come in. It depends on the front end you're trying to build and it depends on the communication between your services. You might or might not use it. It depends if you are building, for example, single page apps and you need to open up uh, WebSockets with your back end for frequent communication or for streaming or anything of that sort. Also, maybe if you are building certain games or things like that, WebSockets might come in handy. Otherwise, not so much. Um, it really depends on where you are working and what you are interacting with. My mitigation strategies, at this point in time, you will not be responsible for those. So I'm just not gonna put them under the uh, P2 level, but you might be responsible for you know, implementing certain monitoring, telemetry and instrumentation type of um, libraries or tooling in your code base. You don't necessarily need to make the decisions on what the tools to use and how to implement them and which standards to adopt, but you might be asked to, you know, add a couple of libraries and push certain events to some uh, telemetry database uh, or telemetry storage solution uh, without necessarily you designing or architecting this space. Obviously, everything I'm saying here it can go really deep. So when I say this is P2 level, it means you need to familiarize with yourself with it to a point where it's you have working knowledge and you don't necessarily, what doesn't necessarily mean you need to become an expert in it because any of these topics can take years for you to master uh, independently of all of the others. Horizontal and vertical scaling, it might be beneficial for you to start understanding the distinction between these two. What does vertical scaling mean? It means adding more resources to your backend, to your web servers, to your appliances, whatever you are using as opposed to scaling horizontally, which means you will replicate sort of or have copies or multiple instances of uh, your application as opposed to adding more compute, RAM, disk space, your existing machines. Now, moving forward to P3, which means you are now going above and beyond. At the P3 level, I think you are quite advanced. You've had maybe two or three years under your belt working professionally as a backend engineer, starting to understand uh, inter-process communication is going to be important. Having a deeper understanding of operating systems and how they work is going to be very important. Memory management in terms of garbage collection, and in terms of how you could utilize memory to your advantage and programming languages that allow you to do memory manipulation. In addition to memory management, threads and concurrency is going to be a very important topic. So you definitely need to deepen your understanding of those at the P3 level. You need to, you probably need to start doing multi-threaded or um, concurrent application development. And these have different principles and different ways of working that you really need to understand so that you can build these applications safely and it's they could get really complicated very easily at this point in time you have to learn or have one statically typed language under your belt it's very essential maybe go at this point would be very reasonable for you to build services that are much more performant than uh, interpreted languages. At this point in time, un having an understanding of NoSQL databases is a no-brainer. You will probably be exposed to circumstances or situations that require you to use either one of these. Maybe a document database could potentially be the first thing you interact with, or maybe even a time series database, you know, because you depends like if you have an IoT application you're working on or whatnot, uh, these could come in handy. At this point in time, you might not be responsible for, you know, building the scaling strategies but you definitely need to start understanding what data replication is sharding not so much it's a very complicated advanced topic but cap theorem is very important for you to start being aware of it at this point in time and what it what it means and what annotations it imposes on your replication strategy and um availability in general. Obviously, at this point in time, having deeper understanding of backend and server side caching is going to be fundamental. All of the levels of testing are now required or you're required to have a good understanding of them. You probably even have written your own integration tests, unit tests and functional tests at this point in time. CI CD is a no brainer. You need to deepen your understanding of the different patterns, branching strategies, which ones work best for the team and the organizational structure that you are part of obviously security will become more and more fundamental and you need to have a deep understanding of all of these topics including everything regarding hashing algorithms and how fast they are at this point in time you probably need to start optimizing for speed and you need to be aware of these uh, the trade-offs and the differences between them. In terms of search engines, I think Elasticsearch is still good. Solar is an esoteric solution. You may or may not need it. It 
really depends. Having a good understanding of test-driven development, domain-driven design, and what these actually mean and how they can, what problems they help you solve is gonna be very important at this stage. Understanding message brokers, RabbitMQ is good because as you build more complicated backend services and as you scale, message brokers will definitely come in handy if you want to implement event-driven types of architecture or even just you know building for resilience and scaling and high availability message brokers will definitely play a big role you understanding how they work how queues work how you can read from queues how you can write to queues how you can implement dead letter queues and all of this fun stuff will definitely come in handy GraphQL, again, is it's one of these very weird areas. Like, it's good to have an understanding of them, but I would still consider this to be optional. Like, it's, it's not really going to affect your career in any way, shape, or form. These are the type of topics that it really depends on the context of where you're working and whether they made the decision to adopt this technology or not. So it really depends. WebSockets and having a deeper understanding of services is going to be very important. And here you're going to have to start learning about mitigation strategies because these will help you build more resilient applications, like how you can do graceful degradation of your services, how you can do throttling, which basically means you can, you know, slow down the amount of requests your backend service is getting so that you can handle the load without breaking, right? How you can handle back pressure, especially when your one of your services goes down and what happens if it comes back up? Will it over flood all of the other services with the requests that have been pending or not? Load shifting and circuit breakers, pretty similar concept. Circuit breaker, it works like an electrical circuit breaker where basically if your service is being hammered and overloaded, you just, it switches off sort of, uh, you know, until it, it can handle the load again and it will just start to gradually picking up more requests as it tries to recover in a way. So these are going to be very important instead of your systems behaving in a very weird way. These will provide you with more controls over how, over the behavior of your backend services. At this point in time, having a good understanding of instrumentation, monitoring and telemetry, telemetry, especially if you are on call, making sense of the diagrams, implementing the diagrams and you know, and how, how things look like and implementing the libraries and identifying which events to collect, which ones are noise, which ones provide actually a signal is going to be very essential. Migration strategies are going to be essential. You need to understand how you can really migrate from one environment to another because you're probably going to face that in your work life. Being able to develop migration strategies is going to be very, very handy. Now, as you can see, there aren't many topics that are left for P4 and P4, as I mentioned, is the category of optional. So let's go back to the top and let me cover what I think are optional or not necessarily super fundamental for you to be a productive back-end engineer. Data replication, we said it's P3, but again, it's sort of borderline optional sharding strategy and all of these things are are definitely optional it goes above and beyond some of us have worked for years without necessarily you know even doing data replication like we just did disaster recovery where basically we just did backups of databases and not necessarily had an environment with a uh, primary and a secondary database where replication was required but it really depends on the environment you're working on at and uh, what type of scale they are trying to deal with. Now, when it comes to other optional topics, uh, as I mentioned, GraphQL would definitely constitute, in my opinion, an optional topic. Graph databases is definitely another one. It's one of these things that you only need in very specific dedicated environments. So if you're building social networks, graph databases might come in handy. Otherwise, not so much. That's uh, pretty much it uh, in terms of optional topics. I think building with observability in mind, we already covered that in uh, this segment over here and we mentioned that this could be a potential P3 topic.